1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, verse 1. Hallelujah. 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Reading out of the New King James Version today. It says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekah in Eph- and Ephes, Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, Ea, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. He was from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And if you don't know what that is, that's about nine foot and I believe nine inches. He was a tall one. He was about three foot taller than Shaq. Y'all know y'all know who Shaq is. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. He had a chain coat on that they used in battle. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels and a shield bearer went before him Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Father, I thank you for your word today, Lord Jesus. And I I pray now again, Lord, as I often pray, Father, that you would speak through me. God, because I could do nothing of myself today, Lord. Lord, only the blessings come, Lord, when you show up and you speak, Lord. So I ask to use me as a mouthpiece. God, that you get all glory, Lord, and that your people today, that we walk out of here strengthened, Lord, our lives changed. Lord, being prepared, Lord, to make ourselves ready for you. And I give you praise, honor, and glory today in your precious name, Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Uh, Again, I know I've been hitting a lot of very familiar scriptures lately. And uh, I look at this scripture and... um, uh, and, and, and as I look at it, uh, I, I've seen it and I've read it. I've preached through it so many times. And I want to just hit over the highlights real fast because I've got somewhere else I'm going. And, and um, you look at this with David. He is not on the scene here yet. We all know that David killed Goliath, but we find that the armies of Israel, they were, they were coming in and they were uh, getting ready to go to battle. But all of a sudden, this man, three foot taller than Shaquille O'Neal, he was a big dude. I mean, I've seen things with Shaq standing next to tall people, and, and he's seven foot tall, seven foot one. This dude is nine foot nine. He's almost ten foot tall. What an amazing sight. Covered in brass armor, brass, uh, bronze uh, shields on his legs, uh, this giant uh, staff on the javelin between his shoulders, uh, uh, got a, somebody carrying a shield in front of him. And he begins to holler out. And not just this one time, but if we read further in the story, we would find that day after day after day, he would come out and taunt. And he said, I defy the armies of, the, of God. And uh, I'd send me out a man and no one would come. And we find, we most of us know the story that David, he come out, his father sent him to bring some cheese and see how the battle was going. And David come in and he began to hear this Philistine say these things. And he began to hear that there was a reward that Saul was offering for any man that would kill this giant. And he's like, is there not a cause? Tell me again this reward, this this great thing that's going to happen. Who who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? He's like, I'll go fight. And got all these men and here's his big brothers there. And they're like, oh, you're just a naughty boy. What are you doing out here? Just a kid. The Bible described David as ruddy. He was, a, you know, according to Scripture, probably red-headed and freckle-faced, small in stature. 
he had something nobody else had. Faith. He also had something under his belt, some battles. And they, he began to rec- re- report what he would do. And finally, the men brought him in before the King Saul. And he told Saul, man, I, I'm ready to go face this giant. And Saul just looked at him. said, this is a man that has been in battle since he was a youth. And you are but a youth. And then David began to rehearse, re- speak some things out. He said, but you don't understand. I, I was a, a shepherd for my father. And along one day come a bear. And when the bear come to take out one of the sheep, I went after him. And I smote the bear and I slew the bear. And, and a lion come by one day and, and the lion got a sheep and I went after him too. And, and God delivered me from the bear. And He delivered me from the lion. He said, I even grabbed the lion by the, by the beard. And he slew him. He said, I'll do the same thing to this Philistine. I want to talk today about recognizing your greatest enemy. Recognizing your greatest enemy. When David first seen that bear, can you imagine? I don't know if you guys ever uh, seen a bear up close. I've seen uh, the closest I've been to bears is some of these full size ones that someone else has already killed. You know, nice rug in the living room or standing in a corner next to a, a log. And Lord knows if he was to move, we would all run. But I watch a lot of these hunting shows and I see people hunting. I watch a lot of these wilderness things and you see people, man, when a bear comes by, you can hear the, the <laughs> that grunt of that bear. And you can see the face of people, the fear when a bear comes close. But David wasn't in fear. Because he's seen there was an enemy that was trying to steal one of these limbs that he loved and he was willing to protect it. And he knew the faith, had faith in God and that God had given him a promise and God had sent a promise to him of what was to come in his life. And he knew that according to if God's word was real, that this bear can't defeat me. And he fought the bear. Probably thought it was his greatest victory. When the lion come by, we all know that the lion, he's the king of the jungle. Man, he's got a roar that can be heard for miles. And when the lion come forth and he defeated that lion, I can assure you, David thought that was his greatest victory. The bear was one thing, but a lion. And then he finds himself in the battle with a giant that no one else would fight. Not his older brothers. Not any of the soldiers that had been battling their lifetime. Not even the the, the king Saul, which was a head and shoulders taller than any other man in the field. And this boy said, surely this is going to be my greatest battle. And, and we all know the story. Saul wanted to try to put his armor on him and David was so small. It was just, he, could, he said, I haven't proven this. I can't use it. He got his slingshot, went out to the brook, got some stones. And man, he went out there and challenged. And of course, so Goliath, y'all, y'all know the story. He just laughed at little David and called him a little, you know, had some sticks. He said, what am I, a dog? You're going to come out here with your little shepherd stick? Didn't have a sword on his side. Didn't have a shield. But he had something that inside of him, a, a promise of God that he had a future ahead of him. And so once again, he faced a loudmouth, roaring giant and defeated him. And surely, this was the greatest enemy that he had ever battled. He found himself... From this day forward, oh, he was the hero of this day. Found himself living in the the house of Saul and the king. And David continued to be anointed by God and go out after battle after battle. And and God was anointing him. And in battles, he would kill thousands and thousands of the enemies of God's people. And one day they were kind of coming through the streets and the the little young women would come by the young girls and they would see David. They would begin to chant his name. They began to sing songs about David. Oh, they said, Saul, he has killed his thousands, but David the ten thousands. And all of a sudden, Saul was the king. The man that was in control of all of this land got jealous. The Bible says he began to hate David. And he began to seek David. He began to get so angry with him that even one time at the table, he took and seen David and he threw his spear at David and just missed him. And David began to run. 
Because David had a new enemy that he didn't understand how to fight. He knew how to take up a sword and fight. He knew how to pick up a spear and throw it. He knew what it was like to have his shield and, and get in battle with his men and in formation. But he is facing someone that his soul loves and respects that should be good to him, that, that should love him. And he didn't know how to fight this. And he ran. And everywhere David ran, his enemy sought after him. Sought to destroy him. Sought to destroy his name. Killed those that was helping him. Even killed the priests that give him bread. He had a new enemy. And David said, how could I touch God's anointed? This was, this was the man that God chose. How could I touch him? How could I harm him? And for years he run and he run and he run from the battle. And you would think that surely a battle that he would face that he knew he could not strike back upon would be his greatest battle. Would be his greatest enemy, surely. Hallelujah. 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 But I got news for you. Saul still was not the greatest battle that David ever faced. It's difficult to recognize. It's not difficult to recognize when the bear was growling and taking the sheep that that was an enemy. It was not difficult to recognize the lion when he was uh, snarling and roaring from such a long ways away that he was a foe and an enemy. And it certainly was not hard to recognize that Goliath standing defying the, the, the armies of God and tormenting day by day the people, it was not hard to recognize that he was an enemy. You know what all of those have in common? David got to be the hero. David got to, to, to settle the score. Then he finds Saul and he can't be the hero of this story. He, he, can't, he can't settle the score. And surely, golly, this got to be the greatest enemy because he can't even, he can't do anything about it. Have you ever had anything like that in your life? Someone, to the hurt and the pain, and things that's done against you by an enemy, by a foe. And, and there's a part of you that, that, man, if it was just anybody else. But sometimes... You have an enemy that you just can't fight. So he ran and he ran and he ran. And you know what? Eventually, God fought the battle for him. There come a time in battle where Saul lost his life. The Bible says that God had removed his anointing from King Saul, that he had withdrew his spirit because of his disobedience. And that's why he was so uh, envious of David, because the spirit of the Lord had been withdrew from him. And he was suffering with hatred and he was suffering with malice and jealousy and it was eating him up. And here David is trying to be faithful and run and run and run. Hallelujah. Surely it was his greatest enemy yet. So here's the question I have for you today. What did his greatest enemy look like? We know what the lion looked like. Big teeth, snarling, the bear, big claws, big teeth. Vicious creatures. We know the description, Goliath, ten foot tall. I mean, covered in, in brass and all kinds of armor. We, we recognize, there's some things we recognize as, as great enemies that, that we can fight. That there is a need to fight. Can I just pause for a moment and tell you in my own life, in my own testimony, that, that when I was uh, bound on drugs and, and I was dealing drugs and I was hooked on drugs and I was getting high every single day and I was doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, having parties at my house all hours of the night with my little girl there. Got so ignorant and thought that I was being a good dad because my, my daughter was going through things it's hard for her at 12 years old. It's hard for me to tell this to be truthful. Started getting high with my own kid to ease her pains. It's easy for anybody to look and say, that's a, that's a giant you've got to defeat. 
Drinking nonstop, constantly having liquor in, in the freezer. I had about I had an assortment of my, my Jack Daniels, my Gentleman Jack, and my Crown Royal, and always had to drink them with Dr. Pepper. I was almost famous for it. Everybody knew what I drank. I spent hundreds of dollars a month in the bars besides all the drugs I was doing. It was easy, Brother Bill, for someone to look at me and say, that is a giant that you got to defeat. That's an enemy that looked to be the greatest enemy of my life. But can I tell you, I needed to defeat that enemy and thank God the Lord helped me. But can I tell you, it's not the greatest enemy I've ever fought. Hallelujah. So again, I ask you the question, what does it look like? Did the enemy look scary? Was he loud and threatening to David? Was he bigger than Goliath? What did the greatest enemy look like? Let me read just a little bit further. 2 Samuel 11 and 1. It says that it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with them, with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Amnon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? And if you look at who that is, he was one of the great warriors in David's uh, um, soldiers. The wife of Uriah the Hittite, which is also a soldier in his army. Then David sent messengers to uh, and took her and she came to him and he lay with her for she was cleansed from her impurity. And she returned to her house and the woman conceived so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. I asked you earlier what the greatest enemy was to David. What it looked like. And early this morning, I captured that enemy and put him in this box. You might say, how did you do that, Pastor? I assure you, it was not easy. If you want to know what the greatest enemy that David ever faced was, you're looking at him. You're looking at the greatest enemy David ever faced was himself. The greatest enemy that I ever faced in my life was not drugs. It was not alcohol. It was myself. It was when I'm alone and nobody else is around as David was on the roof and when I should have been still fighting this battle because can I tell you that the enemy of your soul, he never takes a day off. Can I tell you that the enemy that wants to kill, steal, and destroy you, he, he is always there looking. He is always waiting. And when David come to a point that he said, I've fought enough battles and I've won many victories and I look back and, and I've already defeated the greatest enemy in my life. He didn't realize who the greatest enemy that ever was. It was the one he was looking at in the mirror. The one that he was convincing himself of how great he was and how strong he was and that I can handle everything that's coming before me. That I've already defeated Goliath. I've defeated the bear. I've done these things. But he did those things for somebody else. He fought those battles to save the sheep. He fought those battles to overcome the enemies of Israel. But oh, our own selfish battles. Our own stinking thinking, as Sister Emma said earlier, our own mind that we fight, the battle sometimes it's within, to kind of believe our own life. Do you know we can convince ourselves of some of the most unbelievable things? We can convince ourselves that when we look in the mirror that everything is fine. We look in the mirror, sometimes we say, oh, I've already defeated these giants. 
I'm doing pretty good because I'm not where I used to be. Things ain't bad, Sister Sylvia, as they used to be. Brother Jay, things things ain't bad as they was back in the day. I whipped that battle. So let me just let everybody, let pastor fight this Sunday. I think I'll stay home. Pastor's got it. David said, Joab's got it. He's got the men. They'll go fight the battle. They were steady fighting. I'll just take ease. I ain't no need coming on a Wednesday night and come into the, the Bible study. But Lord, Brother Bill and him, they'll be there. Sister Emma's going to be there. Oh, you know those other saints, those, those, those Bible thumpers, man, they love that stuff. They'll be there. I'm okay. I, Lord, I've had a hard week. Things have been tough and... Lord, you know, I've I've been working extra. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. Everything for yourself. And again, we begin to look into the mirror of selfishness and we say, oh, everything's okay. You have no idea that the greatest enemy you're fighting is that voice inside of your head convincing you, telling you that it's all right. Telling you that, man, you're not that bad. Telling you, oh, that preacher, he's just, he, just, well, well, he just wants me there because he needs somebody to preach to. I told a friend of mine this morning, a good friend, I said, I'm not pastoring because I want to. When God called me to pastor, I, I'm just being honest. I said no. Over and over. Everybody said, they seen it on me. They they said, do you ever feel like you're going to pastor? Nope, not me. Nope. Assistant pastor from where we're at, I can't tell you how many times Brother Jonathan asked me, do you feel like God's ever going to call you to pastor? You're going to, nope, not me. I didn't want to. Brother Bill, I don't like having to have the responsibility and the weight of God in other people's lives upon my shoulders. I don't like being the watchman on the wall, having to sometimes give the news that ain't always good. I don't like and I don't enjoy having to tell people things they don't want to hear. But sometimes the greatest enemy we have when we look and we begin to listen to that lying devil. Do you know about the serpent in the garden? Eve heard a voice that spoke to her and told her what? Surely you won't die. There was a voice convincing her, God, God don't think that you're worthy of this power that you could have if you would just partake. Because you would be as God. Knowing good and evil. Surely you won't die. There's a voice that's been speaking into mankind since the beginning, the fall of man, all the way from the garden, all the way to now. He is still fighting. You cannot do like David and take a break when you should be in battle. The Bible said there was a time when kings went to battle. It's a time where you and I realize that we are in need so desperately. Because we have a world that's going to hell in a handbasket. we got people that don't realize that this thing is even real. There's been so many hypocrites in this world. So many people that are, are lying, lying devils, lying preachers in pulpits. Tickling the ears of people trying to fill offering plates. Trying to fill the building with people sitting so they could have a big church. I didn't want to pastor because I knew that I was not concerned about filling a building up for people for me. I didn't want to pastor because I knew that to be real and to be transparent is hard. I didn't want to pastor because I didn't want that weight on me. You know what I want to do on Sunday? I want to get in that bass boat and go to the lake like I used to do. I want to go in my garage and I want to ride that motorcycle that I hadn't hardly rode in years. That's what my flesh wants to do. I don't want to have to sit for hours and just study the Word of God and seek God, Lord God, give me a message for your people. I don't want to do that. But God called me to be a watchman on the wall. God called me to carry this Word and this Gospel and to love people even when they don't love me back. To love people even when they hurt me. To love people that use me. To love people that do you wrong. And I don't get mad because it's what God called me. It's what he put inside of me and everybody don't have it. It's the gift he gave me. And I come to tell you today that it's time to fight the man that's in the mirror. 
It's time to stop listening to the voices of the enemy, listening to the voices that want to convince you that everything's okay. It's time to stop listening to the voices that, that tell you, yeah, you're fine, you're doing it. Look how much better things are now than it used to be. Look at how much better it was. At least you're not... And you fill in the blank. See, the enemy wants to tell me, you remember when you were dealing dope and living in the house behind this church? At least you're not selling dope no more. You, you do good. You tell people about Jesus all the time. Take off a day. Just go. That's what everybody else does. You deserve it. David was on the roof, and you know what David said? I'm king. I've been fighting battles for years. Lord, I, I didn't touch God's anointed and he was trying to kill me, throwing javelins at me. He, he was doing all these things. I could have killed him in the cave and I didn't. I've done all these great things. I deserve a break. You know what David did? Same thing many of, many of us do. He began to look in the mirror and he said, look at all that hard work you've been doing. Lord, look at you. You're sweating because you've been working so hard. They ain't listening to you no way. What's it going to matter? You got, there's somebody else there willing to lead. Let them lead today. David, just relax. And David, listen to that voice. And he sat down for a moment when he should have been preparing for battle. Just because somebody else is fighting doesn't mean it's time for you to let your guard down. Because there's an enemy, the Bible said, he's out to kill and to steal and to destroy. Why does he, why does he battle us so bad? It's for one reason. Because you're created in the image of God. You are the apple of God's eye. The Lord loved you so much that He made a plan of redemption for you. I don't read where there's any plan of redemption for the devil and his angels. I read of a destination of a fiery pit throughout eternity burning. The Bible says gnashing of teeth, pain and torment. But for us, did we not make mistakes too? Do we not have men all the time uh, constantly putting themselves above God? No different than what the devil did. Say, so what do you mean, pastor? The devil, he, he aspired to have his throne above the Lord and, and to have worship of himself. Are we not also the same generation that is constantly worshiping ourselves with a little selfie and, and, and get on uh, Instagram and Instagram, all the fun things we're doing, the things we can't afford to do. We get out there, we're taking pictures while we're doing this so somebody will think everything's great. But actually on the inside, you can't sleep at night. On the inside, you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay those bills after you had this fun weekend. On the inside, you're freaking out, not knowing how you're going to take care of putting food in your child's mouth. On the inside, you're worried about that job. On the inside, there's no peace. But we keep believing that lie because the greatest enemy you will ever face is you. I'm looking at my greatest enemy. My greatest critic, the biggest liar to my soul. And the sooner you recognize that we are our own worst enemy for one reason and one reason only, it's the nature that you were born with. I hear people all the time, especially in the LGB. Q or whatever, TQ, whatever. I don't know the letters. Say, we're born this way. And that's fine if they feel that way. I'm not throwing stones at anybody. No one sin is any greater than anything I've done wrong, no different than anybody else. But the Bible says we need to be born again. I, I know people that I literally, I, I've seen children, I know kids that were born addicted to drugs that never willingly took one. We all, at some point, no matter what our problem is, no matter what our vice is, no matter what it is, we come to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. Help me to be what you want me to be. 
Because our mind will lie to us. Our mind wants what we shouldn't want. You know, my mind really liked getting high. My mind really liked drinking a lot. But it wasn't good for me. It was like that bear. I, everybody could see how bad it was. Every vice we have, everything that separates us from God. The Lord said, I want to wash you clean. I want to put in you a new spirit. You can't overcome all of these things except one way. The Bible says it's by His Spirit. By His Spirit. Jesus died on the cross for a reason for us to understand. He knew the greatest battle we would ever fight is ourself. He knew the greatest enemy that we would ever fight is the one that planted a seed in mankind. It was the old serpent. The one that opened up the threshold and the door for Adam and Eve to partake of the forbidden fruit and to get the knowledge of good and evil and the evil that will always be inside of you. The only way to overcome it is to overcome it by the Holy Ghost and the Spirit. And the only way to maintain it is to fight your fight daily. There's no sitting down on God. There's no taking a break on God. There's no vacation. Say, I'm not saying you can't have a vacation. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying you don't uh, go and enjoy, uh, go to uh, Chuck E. Cheese or go to uh, Walt Disney. Go, go down to the beach and swim. That's all wonderful stuff. Take a moment. Enjoy this life. But while you're there, tell somebody about Jesus. While you're there, Pray. Why are you down there when you get up in the morning? Read your word a little bit. And take God with you everywhere you go. And don't just pick Him up on the few Sundays that we make it. Hallelujah. The greatest enemy that we will ever fight does not yell, does not scream, does not look threatening. David seen a beautiful woman. And he... Decided that because I'm who I am, I can have her. And it wasn't long. His sins was uncovered. It wasn't long. He, what'd he do? She was pregnant. So then he called for her husband and tried to get to trick him and tried to get him to go lay with his wife so he would think it was his child. And he was such a good soldier. He wouldn't leave the, he would not leave the kingdom. Uh, he would not leave the, uh, uh, Saul's porch. He stayed on Saul's porch. Wouldn't go to his wife. Wouldn't go home. He said, my brothers are in battle there. I could, how could I go home and enjoy such things? I can't do that. David gave him a few more days and David sent him with a note. He said, take this and give it to Joab. He was carrying his own death sentence. And when Joab opened up the, the, the hidden letter, he seen it. He said, put, put Uriah out in the heat of the battle and when, in a place where you know it's the worst. And when it gets really bad, withdraw from him and let him die. David killed him. Had him murdered to try to cover up his own sin. See, David was used to fighting giants that he could see that was yelling and snarling. He didn't realize that there was a, a demon on the inside of him. There was a, a spirit on the inside of him that, that loved to kill, steal, and destroy. Hide what you've been doing, David. Hide these things. Can I tell you, that's the same way the enemy is right now. Don't tell pastor what struggles you're having. Don't, don't share with anybody. Don't get prayer for what your problems are. Don't let anybody know your real struggles. They'll judge you. Hide them. It'll be okay. David tried to hide it, but the Lord didn't let it stay hid. And he also faced judgment. Hallelujah. Let me finish with the scripture. I'm almost done. Matthew 24 and 36 says, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. Talking about the coming of the Lord. But my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. See if this sounds familiar. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field and one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the meal, the one taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, 
he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Can I tell you, a thief does not come snarling and growling into your house in the middle of the night. He don't come banging and beating on stuff. He comes sneakily into your house. He wants to ease in without you knowing he's coming. He wants the least path of resistance. Why? So he can get what's valuable to you and steal it. And there's an enemy that you're not used to fighting at times. That he's not coming, snarling, growling, roaring like the Bible talks about that line, but he's sneaking in. And if we are not on guard, he will slip in. And you will find yourself just like I did. Because I was serving God before I went into all that stuff. I was going to church. I I was preaching already. I was a backslid preacher for a decade. I did things so unbelievable, so horrible that I'm ashamed to tell anybody about. Don't think it can't happen to you. It happened to me. And only by the grace of God. Only because the Bible said that he's married to the backslider. That he continued to call me and call me. And then one day, I said, okay, Lord, I give in. I'm listening. Sister Emma and me was talking this morning on the way here. I was reminding her the night that we were on a bar stool and we made a decision to start going to church the next day on a Sunday. We were talking about God. I told her, I said, I know if I die tonight, I'm going to hell. I said, not that I want to. I said, but to whom much is given, much is required. And She said, let's just do it. I said, do what? She said, serve God. And I said, I won't be a hypocrite. I won't be back in this bar if I'm serving God. I won't be drinking. I won't be getting high. She didn't know I was a dope dealer, so I didn't tell her about that at that time. But I made a declaration, even in a drunken stupor, that I will not be a hypocrite. Even sitting on a bar stool, there was something on the inside of me that refused to halfway serve God because I had seen so many people hurt so many others by that lifestyle. And I said, I won't do it. But when I serve God, I'll serve Him with all my heart. And I won't do it halfway. I won't be here. I won't be getting, I won't be doing these things. And she said again, let's just do it. And most of y'all know the story. That's when I said, you want to go to church with me tomorrow? And she's like, yeah. And she said, I'm glad I've met you now. So I can watch God restore you. And she's still watching day by day God restore me. I'm not a finished product. I'm still on the potter's wheel and He's still shaping me. And every day I try to get closer and every day I try to hear His voice. And I mess up sometimes and I get corrected by my Father. My Heavenly Father, He is a good God, but He will correct you. Can I tell you, you don't want your fields on fire. You don't want God to bring so much correction that you start seeing things around you burn. Today's the day to trust Him. Come on, everybody stand if you're able. If you're not, please stay seated. Hallelujah. Today is your day. Today is a day of change. From the greatest of sins to the smallest of sins. Sin is the only thing that separates us from God and the only way to get sin removed is through repentance. To ask God to forgive you of your sins and believe in Him as your Savior. And know that when He forgives you that He washes it away, it's forgiven and it's gone. you got to forgive yourself. Today is a day of change. Peter told us on the day of Pentecost to those very ones that crucified Him, He said... He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. And he said, and this is a promise. It's for you and for your children, all those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He had the keys to the kingdom. And 3,000 souls that day bowed knee to the Lord. People that had yelled crucify him in Pilate's hall.
People that had realized what horrible things they had done when they asked, what shall we do? When they were pricked in their hearts. And they said, Jesus, forgive me. And they mend it. Today is your day. Whatever it is, let's defeat that devil. Let's defeat the greatest enemy of your life. And ask the Lord to forgive you of every sin. And don't just ask Him to forgive you because you don't want to face penalty, but because you're sorry for what you've done and you want to change. Lord, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Lord, I don't want to keep on doing these things. I don't, I don't want to muddy the water for other people. That, Lord, Lord, I just want you to forgive me and give me the strength to overcome my sins, not live in them. Because I know you're soon coming, Lord. And can I tell you that even if it's not the calling of God, the coming of the Lord, I'm watching people that I love and care about all around me, funeral after funeral after funeral. My wife laid and cried last night over her friend, unexpected, in her 50s, young 50s, gone. Can I tell you that the coming of the Lord for some is sooner than others? And the thief is trying to get in your door. And he wants to steal your future. He wants to steal your joy and your peace. And today the Lord loves you so much and He is waiting to hear from you. As we pray, can I encourage you to talk to Him? The altars are open. You're welcome to come and kneel down here around the, around the front and fit, find your way in if you want to and ask God to forgive you today. Ask Him to wash away the sins in your life. If you've not been baptized in Jesus' name, can I tell you I would love to baptize you in Jesus' name. We'll fill up this pool back here with water. If you're in a hurry, we'll go down to the lake. Makes me no difference. We'll baptize you in Jesus' name. Washing away the sins. Hallelujah. Talk to Him today. Father, I thank You today again for Your Word. I thank You, God, Lord, for those that are here to hear today, Lord Jesus. And Lord, let us, as Your Word says, not be hearers only, Lord, but doers of Your Word. Lord, to know, God, the calling, Lord God, that You have in so many.